What we're going to do in this session is focus on what businesses need to be doing. Uh, maybe uh, those of you who run businesses will get some ideas for what you need to be doing. Uh, we're going to divide the session into two parts. The first will be a keynote speech, and then we'll have a panel discussion uh, with our CEOs. Uh, the keynote is going to be delivered by my compatriot, I'm proud to let you know he's Canadian, uh, Don Tapscott. Uh, in addition to his national credentials, which of course are very important, uh, he is a, I think, a leading international business guru, uh, if you don't mind my using that somewhat hackneyed term. Uh, Don's specialty uh, is the impact of technology on business, and he was telling us in the green room before we came out that he believes that we are living through the equivalent of the Industrial Revolution in terms of the magnitude of change. I hope he'll talk about that. He's the author of 13 books. Uh, his latest one, Wikinomics, was a bestseller in the US for an entire year. And he is publishing a new one in September called Macro Wikinomics. If you like what he has to say, give your business card to one of the incredibly well-organized Googlers at the end of this session and Don will send you a copy of his book before anybody else receives it, so you can be ahead of the curve. And before Don comes up and speaks, I have to warn him about one thing, which is I've been told that like many brilliant guru types, he has a tendency sometimes to speak for longer than he has been asked to. So he will be speaking for 20 minutes only, and then our CEOs will come join him. Please, Don. Thanks very much. Uh, not all of those books were bestsellers, actually. I'm sorry. I wrote a book in 1981 about the internet, and uh, it was a study in bad timing. I think my mother bought most of them. But um, look at I don't think it is over. In fact, I think that we're just beginning on a journey into something uh, very different. This is not just a recession. We've had more than a global financial meltdown. We're in the early days of a fundamental change. And uh, this change is going to affect every business. It's a change that's enabled by technology. Many of the institutions that have served us well for centuries, arguably, have now are come to the end of their life cycle. I think we have a number of stalled institutions, not just the financial services industry, but our old models of the corporation, of government, of education, the media, and many other things. And we need to reboot business and the world. Now, who would have imagined three years ago <clears throat> what's going on today? You know, that, that we would have many countries that are facing a sovereign debt crisis that holds the potential of bringing them and, and many currencies down in the world. Who would have imagined that Goldman Sachs would be charged with fraud, or that, as of last week, many of the big American banks are now under inv criminal investigation by the US government for their activity over the last period. Who would have imagined that <laughs> Matthew uh, Bishop and Michael Green, two uh, business writers at The Economist, would have a book about how to save capitalism. In fact, that's the big theme of books these days. Is capitalism savable? And uh, our Arch Archbishop Mandela uh, this morning was really putting out a challenge to us about what kind of economic system do we need. The world is broken, but we have an opportunity to reinvent it. That if you want to understand what's happening, I think you don't go back to previous recessions. You need to go back a few centuries. We've gone through something like this before. We had an agrarian feudal society where knowledge was concentrated in oligopolies. And along came the printing press, and all of a sudden, many old institutions became inappropriate. We began to understand that there was something better. It didn't make sense for the church to be doing medicine. Uh, we saw the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's greatest act of grace creation of the modern university, the modern corporation. It led to the rise of the Industrial Revolution. And so it is with the internet today. You know, for three decades, uh, I and, and other people have argued that the digital revolution is going to bring about fundamental changes in our economy, bringing about essentially a new mode of production, 
and it will fundamentally change society. But these ideas were ideas in waiting. They were waiting for the new web, a global collaborative platform, they were, of which the people in this room are largely responsible for delivering in Europe. They were waiting for a new generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant for whom all of this is like the air. And they were waiting so, to some, for some fundamental changes to the architecture of the corporation and of other institutions. The web is now changing the deep structure of our institutions and the way that we orchestrate capability in society to innovate, to create goods and services, to create public value, to teach, to learn, and many other things. And they were also waiting for a convulsive shock to the system. That's what's happening today. We're, we have a burning platform that's causing us to rethink how we do many things. Now let me give you an example. I'll start with the corporation. Uh, and the example that I've chosen is as far away from a dot com and a, as I can think of, mining gold. So this guy, Rob McEwen, this is a picture of him. Uh, the reason I know this guy is because he's my neighbor. He moved across the street from me and he held a cocktail party to meet the neighbors. And he said, you're Don Tapscott. I, I read some of your books. And I said, great. I, I said, what do you do? He says, well, I used to be a banker. Now I'm a gold miner. He's a funny guy. He introduces his wife, Cheryl, to the group as, I'm a gold miner. This is my wife, Cheryl. She's a gold digger. But uh, <laughs> thankfully, she's a very competent person with a sense of humor. But um, he tells me this amazing story where he takes over this gold mine, becomes its principal shareholders. His geologist can't tell him where the gold is. He gives them more money to get more geological data. They can't tell him where to go into production. This goes on for several years. Finally, he's ready to shut the whole thing down and, and give up. But he has a revelation. He wonders, if my geologists don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he did a radical thing. He thought differently about the corporation. For example, he took his intellectual property, which in the mining industry is your geological data, your biggest secret. It's kept in safes and high security, uh, security com uh, computer systems. He published it and held a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. It was basically uh, half a million dollars prize money for anyone who can tell me, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? <laughs> he gets submissions from all around the world, 77 of them. They use techniques that he's never heard of, and for his half a million dollars in prize money, he finds $3.4 billion worth of gold. The market value of his company goes from $90 million to $10 billion. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. <laughs> what did he do? He thought differently about what a corporation is and how it works. First of all, he peered. He reached outside the boundaries of the company. He should have fired his geology department. But he, he wondered, now, who are their peers? Some of the best submissions didn't come from geologists. They came from computer scientists. He had chemists. The winner was a computer graphics company that built a three-dimensional model of the mine. He was open. He stood up in the world and he said, look, I'm the CEO of this company. and I don't know if we have any assets. But you can trust me. And they did. He shared his intellectual property. Not that you should share all of your IP. You need a portfolio, some which you own, some which you share within your business network, and some that you give out. He acted globally. He didn't think global and act locally. He viewed the world as a geology department. He increased the value of his company by two orders of magnitude. So there are big changes underway to the corporation. And talent can now be outside our boundaries. And collaboration can happen on an astronomical scale. Big changes to other institutions. I'll see how far I get through these in my time. The financial system, to me, needs a lot more than a, some new regulation. It needs a whole new op modus operandi based on integrity, based on openness. I mean, take something like these toxic financial assets. There's about a trillion dollars of them, plus or minus a trillion dollars, sitting on the balance sheets of banks. We can't value them. Mark to market doesn't work because there's no market. Mark to model doesn't work because who's going to trust a bank these days to tell you what their assets are worth? Why not place these assets in the commons where the world's leading modelers can come together, sort of like a human genome or Linux of risk management? This is not an idea. It's being done. It's a company called the Open Models Corporation. How about the newspaper? 
It's an unbelievable thing. The problem that newspapers solve, of the huge cost of bringing together news and presenting it to the public, it, it's no longer a problem. So we're all on this New York Times death watch. It's a horrible thing. I love the New York Times. How much longer can it service its debt? What will replace it? Well, there are new network models that are emerging, but how do we protect journalism? What happens to quality and to investigation and so on? How do journalists make a living? I write for the New York Times. I might get five letters. My penultimate article for the Huffington Post got 100 responses within four hours. And the Huffington Post has 20 million people. It's 10 times the size of the New York Times. How about our systems for global problem solving? Well. You heard earlier perspective that the G20 is a wonderful new institution for solving problems. Well, it certainly may be a step forward, but the world is organized around nation states. And arguably, the nation state is the wrong size for the global economy. So all these nation states come together in Copenhagen to address a big problem. They fail miserably. Meanwhile, there are 15 to 20 million people just collaborating, using the web to build the first ever movement on planet Earth where we're all on the same side. We've, we've been mobilized before, but they were around world wars and we were on different sides. Now we're all on the same side. So these new multi-stakeholder networks are starting to appear all around the world as a new way of solving global problems that transcend traditional nation states. How about the university? You know, <laughs> I'm convinced, I don't have hard data on this, but anecdotally, I think the smartest students in the United States don't go to lectures. The biggest thing is to get an A without having ever gone to a lecture. The model of pedagogy of the university based on the lecture is wrong. It's one size fits all, it's teacher focused, and the students isolated in the learning process. Why would you go to a lecture if you're uh, at Harvard undergraduate and you hear some TA talking about organizational development when you can go interact with Peter Drucker? Now, I, Sadly, he's passed away, but he's still there on the web educating people. The lecture is the process whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. <laughs> now, I appreciate the irony that I'm giving a lecture, <laughs> but I don't think you're going to remember. You won't remember these 12 institutions that are all being reinvented. Maybe I'll just get you to think differently about something. Governments, the old industrial age bureaucracy model of government, where we collect money from you, tax money, and then we present services to you that we create by people within our, inside our boundaries. This is no longer feasible because governments just don't have the money. You know, we spend big money in infrastructure, tax revenues are down, government coffers are empty, we've got the sovereign debt crisis. We can no longer tinker with government. We need to fundamentally change the way that we orchestrate capability in society to create public value. So you're going to hear in the next discussion about the notion of government as a platform providing data. You just create data and the world will self-organize on top of that to create new value. We've got our models of democracy. Again, inappropriate for a new generation that's grown up. You know democracy and voting is declining all around the world, and it's declining with young people. But it's not because young people don't care. They care a lot. Civic engagement is at an all-time high all around the world for high school and university students. I've studied 11,000 uh, uh, young people for a book I wrote called uh, Grown Up Digital. These kids care a lot. They've got great values, and they know that they're stuck with the problems that my generation is leaving them. But they're not voting. I gave the uh, EU ministerial uh, keynote, uh, keynote to the, the Conference of Ministers on the Reinvention of Government. One of the things they asked me to address was how to get better voting. And I said, well, if you want better voting, you, you should get better government. <laughs> you know, the model of democracy is wrong. I'm a, this is it in the United States. I'm a politician. Listen to this 30-second negative ad where I attack my opponents around issues that, as a young person, you could care less about. Then you go vote for me, and I'm going to broadcast to you for four years, and we get to do it all over again. Why not move to a new model where we reach out and engage citizens? I'm working with a few government leaders now around the world, and this year we're going to do digital brainstorms. These are three-day conversations of the entire population of a country. This is now possible. We can change the model of democracy. The first era, sure, we established these representative institutions and voting, but we, we had an inert citizenry. 
Now we can move to a new model based on active engagement of citizens. How about work? The old Dilbertian model of the corporation. Well, we have a new generation coming into the workforce. It's a huge problem. In Spain, there's 40% unemployment of young people. But these kids come into the workforce. They're bright-eyed. They're bushy-tailed. They got better tools at their fingertips and exist in, in our modern uh, uh, corporations. They have a culture of innovation and collaboration. What do we do? We stick them in a cubicle, treat them like Dilbert, and supervise them, and then we ban their tools. Banning Facebook, popular thing to do. I was talking to the CIO of a state where the governor had banned Facebook. I said, why do you do that? He said, well, young people are wasting their time on the job. Well, if they're wasting their time, is that a technology problem? You solve that by banning a technology? Sure, it's got something to do with workflow and job design and motivation and so on. I said, what was the effect of banning Facebook? He said, well, everybody went to MySpace. <laughs> we, we now have a new set of collaborative tools that create a new operating system for a business. Now, I'm not talking about electronic mails. One youngster said, email, that's yesterday's technology. I, I guess it's good for, say, sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. But that's a, kind of about it. Industrial strength social networks, wikis, blogs, microblogging, idea storms, RSS feeds, uh, collaborative filtering, um, new project management tools. These are becoming the new operating system for a business. Big challenges. How about the media? Well, let's just take the music industry. The internet was the best thing to ever happen to it. Took away the huge costs that have made the industry unproductive. But rather than reinventing their business model to make music a service rather than a product, they look for legal solutions to file sharing. And the industry that brought you Elvis and the Beatles is now suing children, is hated by its customers, and is collapsing. An industry insider in the United States told me that the number three source of revenue for the American labels is suing people who love its product. This is so sad. Science is broken. Healthcare, same thing. It doesn't matter what your, <laughs> your political perspective on this. We need to move towards collaborative healthcare. Here's how it works. When you're born, you get a website. It becomes your personal health page. And it has your entire medical record, but you control it. It's not an electronic health record. And it's like a Facebook or social network page for you where you can collaborate. If you have a rare disease like Lou Gehrig's disease, you'll be in patients like me, sharing information, collaborating. You know, isolation is a risk factor in health. We can overcome that. Engage people in healthcare. And by the way, this activity would create massive data that would contribute to medicine and contribute to science. We can do this. Governments don't have to do a lot. They just have to help in the creation of some standards for this uh, uh, data. And finally, the energy platform. We heard about that earlier, and we'll talk on our panel. But uh, you know, this is not about buying a Prius or something like that. We need to reindustrialize the planet. And we've got, what, 40 years to do it? Bill Clinton was saying at Davos that if we reduce carbon emissions by 80%, not by 6%, by 80% in the year 2050, it'll take 1,000 years for the planet to cool down. And in the meantime, a lot of bad things are going to happen, like a billion and a half people will lose half of their water supply. So a number of institutions that are stalled, but on the other hand, based on the web, we've got new open collaborative models based on these new principles of peering and sharing and, and networking and integrity and understanding interdependence and so on that are just happening that show us the contours of a new set of institutions throughout all of society. This is a time of great opportunity. And it's also a time of great danger. Uh, this is from a week ago in Greece. This is from two days ago in Thailand. We need to reinvent the world and our institutions. And the stakes are very, very high. Um, I'm thrilled that you're apparently in your rooms tonight, you'll be given a advanced copy of chapter uh, number one of the, uh, the new book. And uh, this is basically my, my life's work. And I'm very uh, excited about it, because I think that this is a time when we need to bring about some big changes. There was a French pilot from the Second World War. His name is Saint-Exupéry. 
He was a philosopher. And he said, we should welcome the future, for soon it will be the past. But we should respect the past, for it was once all that was humanly possible. When I stand here, I, I don't mean to be critical of anything that we've done. We did what was possible. And, in, and the industrial economy and industrial capitalism advanced prosperity and social development all around the world over decades and even centuries. But it's now possible to go forward. And another Frenchman, Victor Q, uh, Hugo, said there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. The time has come for the new web. The time has come for a new generation to have their birthright, the, talking about the digital divide, access to this new communications medium. And the time has come for some fundamental changes to most of the institutions in our society. Tinkering, while necessary, I think will be insufficient to get us forward. And uh, hopefully the time has come for each of you to, I don't know, find that uh, leader within you to transform, uh, transform your company and in doing so to change the world. Uh, the next period will not be boring, that's for sure. So let's have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you.